So officially, welcome everyone. Thanks for being here with us uh, this afternoon. My name is Carla Montalvo. I am the coordinator of the Roots and Shoots um, groups in Puerto Rico. And today we're celebrating a pollinator week all week long. And today we have uh, two special guests. Her names are uh, Abby, Abby Abramson and Claire. And I'm going to start presenting them so they can start with their presentations. Um, Abby is a college student from Rehoboth, Massachusetts, studying so sociology and environmental studies. She is a member of the Roots and Shoots US National Youth Leadership Council and is passionate about environmental health, biodiversity, and gender equality. In her free time, she loves exploring new things, whether it be through hiking, kayaking, or reading a book. That's Abby. So I'm going to present Claire too. Uh, Claire is an eighth grader from Orlando, Florida. This is her second year with the National Youth Leadership Council. Her first Roots and Shoots project, the Game Exchange Box, taught her that she wanted to spend the rest of her life making a difference with others. She is proud to see that this project is not only thriving in her community, but also spreading to cities across the country. Claire has also worked on a social action project to bring neighbors together in the face of gun violence. If she isn't taking pictures of swimming laps, <laughs> she might be working on an invention. Claire hopes to become a doctor when she grows up so she can cure type one diabetes and never wear her insulin pump again. So that is uh, your presentation, right? Uh, so you can start, Abby, doing your, um, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen really quick. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Happy Pollinator Week, everybody. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm really excited to be here um, today and to share some project ideas on how to support the monarch butterfly um, to celebrate poll pollinator week um, and also the monarch butterfly is just such an amazing creature so I'm very excited to talk about them with you. Um, Carla introduced me a little bit. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about myself. Um, like Carla said, I am studying environmental studies and sociology in college. Um, and my first um, Roots and Shoots project in 2014 was called Monarchs and Milkweeds. And my goal for that project was um, I wanted to plant milkweed to help um, provide more habitat for the monarch butterfly. Um, and I also wanted to fundraise for the Monarch Butterfly Fund um, so I could help another organization um, that's protecting the monarchs. Um, I wanted to do this because I grew up um, spending a lot of time in my grandparents' garden. They live in the same town as I do. And I really loved seeing the monarchs growing up um, on all of the flowers. And I started noticing that they weren't coming back as much. And there were several years where we didn't have um, the butterflies in our garden at all. And so um, that's why I wanted to start this project because um, I really wanted to bring them back and to provide enough habitat for them. And also just a fun fact about me, um, my favorite animals are the monarch butterfly um, and also the Sumatran rhino. Um, so a few um, quick cool monarch facts I wanted to share with you all, um, because like I said, they are super amazing species. Um, there are actually two different populations of monarchs. Um, so the Rocky Mountain range kind of splits the two populations. So on the Western half is the Western population. And then on the Eastern side um, where I live is the Eastern population of monarch butterflies. And um, monarch butterflies lay their eggs only on milkweed plants, which is why it's so important that we plant milkweed um, varieties native to our areas. Um, that way there's enough habitat for the monarchs to lay their eggs. And um, when the eggs hatch into caterpillars, um, the caterpillars consume the milkweed leaves, but the leaves contain a certain type of toxin that fills them. It doesn't hurt the monarch caterpillars, but if any species, other species tries to eat them, um, it would hurt them. So by eating the milkweed, um, the caterpillars are protected from uh, predation. And um, I learned this fun fact this week, and I thought it was really interesting. Um, during the mating season, 
male monarch butterflies attract females to them by releasing a scent from their wings. So um, basically they're attracted to each other through scent, which is really interesting. And the photo um, on this slide is a milkweed plant in my grandparents' garden. And if you can see right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's kind of near last bullet point. Um, that's a monarch butterfly egg right there. Um, so the first project idea I wanted to share with you um, is one that I started out with with my project, which was growing milkweed at home, um, just to start providing more milkweed in plants for the monarch butterflies to lay eggs on and for caterpillars um, to be able to grow big on. And so how I started this project was my grandmother had a milkweed plant in her garden. So towards the end of the season, I think it was around late September, early October, um, the milkweed pods, um, which is on the far left photo, um, they release milkweed seeds. And um, when they break open, you can kind of, um, before they all start blowing out, you have about a two to three day window where you can take the, um, the seeds. It's kind of organized like a corn on, on the cob and you can pull the seeds out um, and then collect the seeds. As you can see in the second photo, um, all of the seeds on a sheet of paper that I collected. Um, and the uh, something I learned while doing this project that was really cool is that the fluffy kind of part on top of the seed um, is what helps the seed blow farther away from the site that it's at um, when it's released so that uh, there could be more and more milkweed um, as far as possible. So after I collected all of the seeds for this project, I learned about a method um, because I couldn't plant them right away. I live in Massachusetts, um, which is in the northern part of the US and um, it gets really cold um, in the winter. So I couldn't really plant the seeds right away before spring. So what I did was I took some plastic sandwich bags and I put the seeds in between kind of damp paper towels and then I sealed the bags, made sure there was no air in them and put them in the refrigerator. And what that does is it kind of acts like if the seeds were still outside um, and they were just on the cold ground, that kind of preserves them. But in order for me to plant them, I had to keep them with me. So I put them in the fridge and it kind of acted in the same way. And I just put the dates on them because um, that way I knew when they were ready to be planted in the spring, which was, um, around March, I started planting them. And then in the last photo, all the way to the right, you can see um, kind of a really small milkweed plant. Um, and it eventually grew bigger, but that's kind of the size that I started them at when I planted them at home. Um, so that's the first project idea for helping the monarchs. And then um, if you want to do something a little bit bigger um, where you have more space, um, a project idea is starting a monarch waste station. And a monarch waste station is basically uh, a habitat um, location that's designated for monarch butterflies. So you can register your site, as you can see in the um, photo on the right. Uh, we got a sign after we registered the site in my grandparents' yard, and that way everybody knows it's a monarch waste station and what it's about. And in these other two photos, you can see uh, some of the plants that we had in the flowers for the monarchs and other pollinators um, like bees and hummingbirds. And in this photo, it's kind of small all the way to the left, but there is a monarch. That's one of the first ones that came back to our garden after we registered it. So a little bit more information on how you can register a monarch way station. Um, this is a screenshot from the Monarch Watch website. But um, this is the link here if you want to take a photo of it, and I can also put it in the chat afterwards. But um, if you visit monarchwatch.org, they have information about what the Monarch Way stations include and how you can create one. And then there's a form where you can register it, and they'll send you a sign, um, kind of the same one that we have in our garden. And so that is another great way um, to provide more habitat for the monarch butterflies by creating a way station. Um, another idea for um, projects to support the monarchs are um, a milkweed fundraiser. So when you um, grow your milkweed at home or maybe you order some seeds um, from a local store, uh, you can grow the milkweed plants and then um, sell them at either a local plant sale or garden sale. Um, 
sometimes I've sold them like at the side of the road. Um, if it's safe in your area, um, there's not too many cars. Um, or you could also ask a local business if you could just set a table outside their store for maybe the day or the weekend. If they'd be willing, you could um, also fundraise by sharing information about the monarchs with people and um, selling mil milkweed. And then you can take the milkweed money, of course, um, and then donate it to whatever organization um, you feel you'd like to donate it to to support the monarchs. And I also have a link here, if I can put this one in the chat as well, um, but you can find native plants in your area. And so if you want either for the way station or if you were to do a fundraiser like this, um, you could find native plants to your area through this tool. And that's really helpful for figuring out which plants um, are best for the monarchs in your area. And then this um, project idea is one that I'm currently working on. Um, like I said, I'm in college and I was trying to think of a way to um, kind of fundraise for the monarchs while also getting other people engaged and interested in um, protecting them. And so um, the idea that I have is towards the beginning of the school year, um, people are usually trying to find new decorations for either their lockers or their dorm rooms. Um, and I think monarch butterflies are just really beautiful creatures. And um, also the flowers um, that come with, you know, monarch butterfly gardens and pollinator habitats are also really beautiful and colorful. And so um, my plan for this project and something you could do as well is creating room decorations or artwork like pictures or um, monarch butterfly cutouts for the wall. And um, you could sell them um, to whatever audience you choose and also use that money as a fundraiser um, for the monarch butterflies for an organization of your choice. Uh, I wanted to include a few ideas um, of organizations that are currently working to protect the monarch butterfly and pollinator habitats. Um, these are some of the organizations I know of, and I know there's a ton more out there, um, but just in case you needed a few ideas to start. Um, Roots and Shoots, of course, has a lot of um, people working on projects for way stations. Um, there's something called the Mayor's Monarch Pledge that several um, National Youth Leadership Council members have done where um, you can petition your local government um, to sign a pledge if you have a mayor or board of selectmen um, kind of promising to protect monarch butterfly habitat. Um, there's also Monarch Watch, which I shared earlier. That's the organization where you can register a monarch waste station, uh, the Monarch Butterfly Fund, the World Wildlife Fund, Xerces Society, Journey North, and the National Wildlife Federation are also all organizations who have either initiatives or they're working completely to protect the monarch butterfly habitat. Um, so thank you for inviting me to this presentation. Um, I really appreciate um, your time and I hope this was helpful. Thank you, Abby, for your presentation and for sharing your projects with us. Well, I think it's um, time for Claire presentation too. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen really quick. Okay, so hi, my name is Claire. I'm from Orlando, Florida. I don't really go to regular school, but I do take classes at my local college. And this is actually my third year on the council. I'm 14 and I spend most of my time training as a competitive swimmer. And today I was just going to talk about how you view the world and your place in it. So a lot of people think that you have to be the person who leads a project in order to participate in it and make a difference. And I feel like when you think of it like that, it instantly becomes overwhelming and you freeze up. Even when you have awesome mentors like I do, like the leadership council and people who say even a little project can make a big difference. I still thought it'd be too big or too hard or take too much time and I wouldn't be able to follow through with it. But the truth is that you don't have to be the leader of your own project to make a big difference. In fact, depending on what you choose, you can contribute to a lot of projects. And in the end, you can make a huge difference. So here's how we started for me. One day we were on a field trip to study the local architecture by looking at a house built in our neighborhood. Around every single corner, I saw something that was a really cool moment like a tiny little sculpture. And I asked my mom if I could grab her phone to take some pictures of it. The architect is named James Gamble Rogers and his architecture made me realize that there were little stories everywhere 
that if I saw, I could take pictures of. My mom and dad were so impressed with my photos I took at Casa Feliz that they let me use their real camera. It's a DSLR, so a digital single lens reflex camera. They allowed me to take pictures when we went out to our next field trip, which happened to be a nature preserve. While we were there, I was fascinated with the trees, but I really wanted to take pictures of the insects there. But with a regular camera, I couldn't get close enough to take pictures to where they were being focused. And all my attempts didn't really come out well, and I was really frustrated with it. When we got home, my dad told me about a kind of lens called a macro lens. It's basically like a magnifying glass and it starts at a one to one ratio, meaning the image in the viewfinder is the same size as real life finger photographing, but some lenses do two to one or even three to one. This means that you can really see up close and focus in on the things that are quite small. That's the good part about a macro lens. The bad part is that you have to be super close, like less than 30 centimeters, and you have to be super still in order for it to focus. There's no moving the lens in and out to focus. It's literally like a magnifying glass and you have to move your body around until you hit the perfect spot where where you want to see is in focus through the lens. Here's some of the pictures that I took when I was first starting out and learning how to use my lens. The details and the structures I was capturing were just like the shapes and patterns that I originally saw in that house. From the eyes of this dragonfly down here to the stamens of the flower, everything was just so beautiful. But like, how does that make a difference for anyone? One day I was taking pictures of the stamens of a flower and I was getting a really cool shot of pollen and the condensation. And a bee came to pollinate the flower that I was shooting. He just quietly floated in the frame and was in focus. I really, in the nicest way possible, I hate bees. They're, they're scary. They have little stingers and no matter what I tell myself, my brain won't acknowledge the difference between a bee and a wasp. But this little guy, this is actually the guy, the original one. He just floated in a frame and stayed on this flower and let me take his picture. When I got home, oh wait, yeah, that's the other thing about macro photography. You can't really see anything in the tiny viewfinder, like on the camera when you take the photo. So it looks good when you take the picture, but when you get home, it can be blurry or out of frame. So I got home and I saw it. I got home and I saw it. And there were plenty of them that were soft or out of focus, but there were some really good ones as well. A few weeks later, my mom took me to see Joel Satori give a talk at our local college. I'm actually going to stream his website if I can get out of this PowerPoint. So this is Joel Satori. Mr. Satori is a photographer working for National Geographic, and he's working on a project called the Photo Arc. He's traveling all over the world to zoos that have the last animal of their species and are photographing them in detail before they go extinct. He not only wants to document them, but he also wants to use his photographs to continue the conversation about global warming, conservation, and the devastating effects that humans have on the animals that we share the planets with. So here's some of his photos down here. I can link this website in the chat, but you can click on any one of these and see the animals in detail. Like that. So after his talk, I waited in line to meet him and to show him my pictures. He was very supportive and encouraged me to focus on the bees. He said that my pictures could help other people see the bees the way that I did, so that they were so cute and cuddly and not just. So I went home and purchased the domain name Expose Extinction, it's my website. Initially, I was gonna catalog the bees and do all the research and start a project to save them. As you can imagine, that was a lot to undertake at my age. My love is the photography and not the research and the advocacy. Although I do support both, I'm definitely not an advocate person and I'm definitely not a research person. So my project kind of sat dormant for a little while while I tried to decide what to do with it. But then I was able to get on the National Youth Leadership Council and I learned that my role isn't to do that at all. I switched my focus from photography and like advocating to be a project about sharing. I made my bee photography open source for nonprofits, for other council members and other nonprofits to use in their work to save the bees. This past year, I was able to participate with a bunch of different projects here on the council and otherwise. In fact, I was chosen to be an ambassador for Adobe Gen Create, and through that project, literally millions of people have been able to see my bee photos. So now I'm free to concentrate on what I really love, which is photography. And I know that I love what I'm doing and what I'm good at has a place just as much as anybody else. So here's some of my photos, I'll show them real quick. So I have a bunch of different kinds, like regular bees. This is a sweat bee. I can also link this in the chat if you want. 
do everything to get so close and they're so cute. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that everyone can make a difference if you're honest with yourself about what you about what you're committing to, because doing something is better than doing nothing. And as long as you know where to send that something out to the universe, I think that's enough. And that's about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Alvi. It's amazing what you're doing with your projects. And I feel like very proud of you too and everything you're doing. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting both of you in 2019. So I'm very grateful for that encounter and for everything that I had learned from you. So I don't know if anyone has any questions for Claire or Abby. You can do it or you can avail it to your microphone or write it uh, on the chat. And Mejia, she's from Chile and she says, thank you, it's so wonderful. Um, Abby, are you there? Can you hear me? Uh, she, she also said it's totally inspiring, girls. Um, when did your, uh, Abby, when did your uh, your love for the monarch butterfly started? When did you find out that you liked them and you wanted to do projects with them? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think when I was um, just growing up, seeing them in my grandparents' garden, um, I've just always been intrigued by um, different animals. And I used to be able to just sit and watch them um, for a long time. And I thought they were really incredible. Um, but then when I started, when I learned that they were endangered, and then I started doing more research about them, I just learned more about um, just how they interact as species and I got to learn more about you know how they're similar to us and how they're also different and have you know really cool abilities and I think that's when I realized I really love them. So what, what was your first project uh, with the with the butterfly motors? At, at what age did you start it, uh, your first project with, with them? Mm -hmm. I think I was about 13 or 14. Um, I joined Roots and Shoots in 2014. So I think it was, yeah, I think it was 14. And um, yeah, that was my first project was just collecting seeds and planting milkweed plants. Awesome. And, and Claire, when did you find out that you wanted to take photographs of the bees for the first time? And what was your, like your, um, the, the most amazing picture you you think you you took uh, of them or any other insect. Uh, so I actually started photographing bees in 2016, but I've always had a love for photography, and I cannot pick a favorite. I'm sure my website. That's awesome. And what is it that you want to study, Claire? Um, when you go to college. So you wanted to be a doctor, right? I would I would love to do something in the medical field. But I would also try to find time to keep up with my photography because I think it's important to have a balance of like work and passion. So nice. Uh Recently, um, Roots and Shoots USA like ended a uh, global campaign, Connect with the Change, right? Um, how was your experience with that, uh, with that campaign? You know, you were part of the pollinators, uh, right? Animals, the, the animals or pollinators. How was your experience with that for both of you? Um, for Claire can, you know, speak to the pollinators, um, part, because I know she was part of that part of the campaign. Um, I was part of more of the environment, um, part of the campaign. Uh, I did the litter cleanup in my town. So I talked about that and, um, on an Instagram live, but, um, other than that, I think the Roots and Shoots Connect the Change campaign was um, really exciting because it was broken into, um, several weeks that were 
kind of divided into three topics that Roots and Shoots focuses on. So the people, the animals, and the environment. Um, and the calendar that Roots and Shoots had um, to follow along with was really great because they had so many different project ideas that were um, ideas that either I hadn't heard of before or there were really easy steps to take um, to do the projects um, during the campaign if we wanted to. Um, so I thought it was a lot of fun. It was also really cool to see what other people are doing and just be able to connect with other people um, to celebrate Roots and Shoots anniversary. I also agree with Abby. I think that the way that they broke it up into different weeks and had each week have three different focuses, I really, really enjoyed being part of it. And I hope that we get to do something like it again because I think it was, it was a really cool experience. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm very grateful that, uh, with both of you for being with us. Um, and I don't know if anyone else uh, wants to say something or write it on the chat. Um, okay, Ligea has a question. She says, what would you motivate to people, especially kids, for working on this project? Sorry. What would you do to motivate people, especially kids, for working on this kind of projects? <laughs> That's the question. Abby or Claire? I think I really liked kind of um, part of Claire's story. I think it's a great, um, also translates to kind of a great piece of advice, which is, um, you know, starting with an idea and just finding your path and just going wherever your heart takes you and wherever your interests take you, um, because I think that's ultimately um, where you're, if you want to, you know, create a positive change, that's how you could have the most impact is just, I think, um, by teaching younger kids that, you know, if they just follow their interests and follow their heart, um, then they will end up with, you know, ideas and projects that they really enjoy. Um, I really loved that part of your story, Claire. So I think that was a great piece of advice. Thank you. I definitely agree with you that just having them follow their passion and doing what they like to do, it's going to make an impact. And it's just, just yeah, doing what you like, I think. Thank you, girls. Um, yeah, like Dr. Jane always tell us, it's true stories. We share stories and that's how we connect with people. Every time you tell a story um, and you say that, um, you tell that from your heart, then that's how you can connect with people. And that's how you, you make a change. She doesn't separate people like they're, they're good or bad. She just like tells a story and she gets to the heart of people and that's how it works. So thank you girls, Javi, Claire for being with us today. Um, I'm very grateful. Like I say, I'm very proud of everything you're doing and your studies and your projects and everything. So I um, really appreciate for you to take your time to be with us today. I don't know if uh, the people that are participating, they can like, um, you know, open your cameras so we can take a picture. And I think that we can wrap it up for the Facebook Live. So I don't know, Abby, Abby or Claire, if you want to say something like, um, something to motivate kids or people that they want to work with pollinators, um, what would you say to them? What would be like a, a good advice <laughs> for kids or adults to start a project today to help pollinators all over the world? I really think just following your passion is the right way to go about it. So if you have something about it that interests you or you're interested in in any way, just follow your passion and do what makes you happy and you'll get there. Yeah, I agree with Claire. I also think just starting small, like you don't have to start with a huge project. If you just have, you know, an idea and, you know, you could just start small and build your way up with it. Um, I think that's also a great way to start. Thank you so much. So I don't know if anyone else can like, uh, you know, turn on your cameras. Um, I'm going to stop the Facebook live here. So thanks to everyone who's been watching us or who's going to be watching it later. So thanks for connecting with us.